Let's talk first about differential diagnosis for the cellar, paracellar, and supracellar region. Adult patients commonly have pituitary adenomas, but may also have craniopharyngioma. The type of craniopharyngioma in adult patients has a squamous and papillary histology. In contrast, in children, the most common lesions are optic and chiasmatic hypothalamic gliomas, where the possibility of having a different flavor of craniopharyngioma, the adamantinomatous histology. Obviously, in this region, we also have the vessels of the circle of Willis that can give rise to aneurysms. We can have meningiomas, skull-based lesions, including chordomas, basal or meningitis, which is typically going to be fungal or tuberculosis, granulomatous diseases like sarcoid, and a variety of other possibilities. Pituitary adenomas are generally classified as being microadenomas, or macroadenomas. Most patients with pituitary adenoma are going to be adult or at least postpubertal. Macroadenomas are defined as being larger than 10 millimeters. They typically cause smooth enlargement or ballooning of the cella. And visual symptoms are the common presentation if the lesion extends more than six millimeters above the roof of the cella or the diaphragma cella. The classic visual problem is going to be bitemporal hemianopsia. In contrast, there are also microadenomas, which are defined as being less than 10 millimeters in diameter. These are entirely contained within the gland, and these patients present because of endocrine symptomatology, either from a prolactin-producing tumor, acromegaly or gigantism from a growth hormone-producing tumor, or Cushing's disease from a tumor-producing ACTH. Many patients are referred for imaging because of elevated prolactin. This can be caused by a microadenoma or a macroadenoma, but may also be the result of the stalk effect. Prolactin inhibitory factor, which is really dopamine, travels down the pituitary stalk from the hypothalamus. The stalk effect may cause an elevation of serum prolactin up to about 150 or 200 nanograms. Most pituitary adenomas, whether they're micro or macro, are going to cause elevations outside of that range, typically in the range of 200, 500, or even 1,000 nanograms. There is also some type of a cross-reaction in patients who have hypothyroidism because of elevated of uh, TSH. There can be exogenous prolactin, and there can be pharmacologic drug effects, and there's a long list of medications that will cause prolactin elevation through that mechanism. This is a patient that has a pituitary microadenoma. Detection of microadenomas usually involves making thin sections and also dynamic imaging. The normal pituitary gland will enhance earlier and wash out earlier than the sparse vascularity of a pituitary microadenoma. So if we do dynamic imaging and capture images rapidly, we'll be able to see in these patients that the normal gland enhances early, as is seen here, and the pituitary microadenoma is seen as a delayed enhancing region inside of the pituitary gland. This is a pituitary macroadenoma. It has grown out of the ballooned pituitary fossa and into the supracellar cistern. The neural tissue, the hypothalamus, is draped over the top of the mass. The mass shows homogeneous enhancement, but many macroadenomas will undergo degenerative changes, including hemorrhage and necrosis, and will enhance heterogeneously. This is a different patient who also has a macroadenoma. Macroadenomas have been described as having a lower incidence of producing hormonal or endocrine effects, which would have allowed an earlier symptomatology and an earlier clinical presentation. Again, the lesion here is heterogeneous, but we can still see that there are signs of bone remodeling around the pituitary macroadenoma. Pituitary macroadenomas present because the patient loses their peripheral vision, what the patient will describe as tunnel vision, what healthcare professionals describe as bitemporal hemianopsia. Bitemporal hemianopsia is easy to understand if you remember that the lens of the eye inverts the image and that the nasal fibers of the retina, which perceive vision from the lateral or temporal visual fields, are going to cross in the optic chiasm. 
whereas the lateral retinal fibers head straight back without crossing to the ipsilateral occipital lobe. So if we cut or press on the chiasm, we're going to lose the nasal retinal fibers, and that means we're going to lose our peripheral or temporal vision. We're going to have a bilateral temporal scotomata. David and Goliath might be a parable to help explain the correlation of uh, the visual symptoms and the headache in patients who have pituitary macroadenomas. We remember that Goliath was a big guy. He was a giant. Why was he so big? Well, maybe he had a growth hormone secreting pituitary adenoma that presented before his epiphyses fused. So he grew to a very, very large size. After the epiphyses fused, he stopped getting taller, but he continued to have soft tissue overgrowth, what we call acromegaly. He was an angry giant. Maybe he was angry because he had chronic headaches from increased intracranial pressure because his microadenoma had now grown into a macroadenoma. Little David was able to sneak up on the giant Goliath because he recognized that the giant had a blind spot on either side. The giant had tunnel vision. So David could sneak up on him from the side because the giant had bitemporal hemianopsia from his pituitary macroadenoma. And how is it that only one stone was able to fell the giant? Well, perhaps the impact of the stone upon the giant's head caused hemorrhage into the pituitary gland, caused pituitary apoplexy, and the giant succumbed to a dramatic and rapid increase in intracranial pressure. Pituitary apoplexy can produce dramatic changes on imaging, including the formation of a blood fluid level with the dependent area representing the blood products. So again, pituitary adenomas are divided into microadenomas and macroadenomas. Microadenomas present with endocrine symptomatology and macroadenomas typically uh, present because of mass effect. Another common cellar and supracellar lesion is the craniopharyngioma. About 75% of craniopharyngiomas will present in the supracellar cistern and then secondarily extend into the pituitary fossa. Craniopharyngiomas consist of two histologic types. Children commonly have the Adam antinomatous flavor of craniopharyngioma, whose histology resembles the enamel organ of the tooth bud. These are commonly very heterogeneous with fluid-filled areas full of machine oil, which may cause T1 shortening and be bright on a non-contrast T1-weighted image. The solid portions should enhance and are very commonly calcified. And one problem with craniopharyngiomas is that they tend to be sticky to the overlying hypothalamus, and they can induce a rip-roaring pilocytic astrogliosis. A biopsy specimen of this astrogliosis will oftentimes be mistaken for the histology of a hypothalamic glioma, a pilocytic astrocytoma. This tumor, of course, as you know, is named after the 1980s rock group, Adam and the Ants. The adult histology in craniopharyngioma is a little bit different. They typically have a squamous and papillary architecture. They can be solid or can also be heterogeneous and partially cystic. Calcification is less common, and these are a little bit easier to resect because they don't produce that same adherence to the overlying neural tissue. Illustrated here is a plain radiograph of a child that has a lesion causing a J shaped cella. This is classically ascribed to a patient with a supracellar lesion, not a pituitary adenoma, and most commonly in a child that would be a craniopharyngioma. If we actually look at the corresponding MR in this patient, we can see that the craniopharyngioma is relatively homogeneous and hyper intense, not from hemorrhage, but because of the lipid material that is contained within the fluid, the machine oil consistency that neurosurgeons and pathologists oftentimes discuss. This again is the machine oil. We can see in this operative photograph that there is this brownish red discoloration here, and that is uh, going to have the lipid signal intensity on MR. This is another example of a very, very large and very heterogeneous supracellar lesion extending down into the pituitary fossa, and this unfortunately is a patient that died from a craniopharyngioma.
We can also have gliomas that arise in the region of the hypothalamus or the chiasm. These are typically pilocytic astrocytomas that enhance very brightly. Optic nerve gliomas may be associated with von Recklinghausen's neurofibromatosis or NF1. We can have a hamartoma of the tuber scenarium. This arises uh, in between the chiasm and the mammillary bodies. These lesions do not have contrast enhancement and classically they're described as having gelastic or laughing seizures, but that's actually only seen in about 40% of patients. We can have children that have Langerhans histiocytosis commonly presenting with diabetes insipidus. That should have contrast enhancement. We can have primary supercellular germinomas and CSF seeding from pineal region germinomas that seed into the supercellular cistern. And we can have CSF spread of a variety of other lesions as well. This is a child with a hypothalamic glioma. Hypothalamic gliomas are almost always pilocytic astrocytomas, which can show heterogeneous or homogeneous enhancement. The appearance may mimic that of a craniopharyngioma, but in this case on the sagittal image, we can't separate the hypothalamus from the mass because the hypothalamus is the mass. These are images from two different patients. The sagittal is the same patient we just looked at. The axial image shows a homogeneously enhancing hypothalamic pilocytic astrocytoma, thus illustrating that the appearance is variable. Unfortunately, the patient who had the heterogeneous pilocytic astrocytoma eventually succumbed to the continued enlargement of the mass. In this location, unlike the situation when we have a cerebellar hemispheric pilocytic astrocytoma, the lesion could not be resected. Pilocytic astrocytomas commonly have BRAF mutations as their tumor marker. This is another hypothalamic pilocytic astrocytoma. These are WHO grade one tumors that have BRAF mutations. Notice that this mass is both supercellular and extends down into the pituitary fossa, compressing the normal gland, including the posterior pituitary bright spot against the floor and dorsum cella. We can see the lesion has heterogeneous enhancement. Once again, it might imitate the appearance of a craniopharyngioma. This is an example of a non-enhancing supercellular mass located in the supercellular cistern in between the chiasm and the mammillary bodies, the perfect location for a hamartoma of the tuber scenarium. We can again see in the axial plane that there is this rounded soft tissue mass without enhancement in the supercellular cistern, the classic and typical location for a hamartoma of the tuber scenarium. Again, putting them side by side, we can see the pilocytic astrocytoma shows contrast enhancement and the hamartoma of the tuber scenarium does not enhance. And that's an important way to make the differential diagnosis. This patient presented with bilateral six nerve or abducens palsy. The sagittal reformation demonstrates a destructive lesion involving the posterior portion of the clivus. The pituitary fossa is intact. We can see on the MR that there is a soft tissue mass that has destroyed the cortical bone, normally seen as a dark outline around the triangle of a clivus. We can also see that the lesion is not involving the pituitary fossa and it extends backwards intracranially, pushing on the pons. The lesion shows heterogeneous contrast enhancement. A solitary lesion of the clivus, a solitary destructive lesion of the clivus is very suggestive of the patient having a primary non-sarcomatous tumor of bone, the chordoma. So chordomas are primary within bone, but they arise from remnants of the embryologic notochord, which is an ectodermal structure. Again, we can see that there is destruction of the posterior part of the clivus. We have a bulky lobulated mass. Chordomas are very poorly vascularized. They contain fissiliferous or vacuolated cells that may give the tumor a water-like attenuation and water-like signal intensity on T2 
The axial images, again, demonstrate destruction of the bony clivus. The MR images demonstrate that the lesion abuts against the flow voids for the internal carotid artery, but the lesion is entirely extradural, despite its posterior extension. Chordomas are associated with significant bone destruction, but they oftentimes respect the soft tissue structures of the dura, and if they breach the dura, they almost never invade into the adjacent brain. This is another chordoma. Again, we can see here that the anterior arch of C1 and the odontoid process are preserved, but there is a large lobulated bulky mass that extends both ventrally and posteriorly. So the characteristics of chordoma include a midline origin in almost every case, a bulky bosselated or lobulated mass, significant bone destruction, often heterogeneous, and many parts of the tumor are water-like in attenuation and in signal intensity. This is the most dangerous mass that presents in the supracellular cistern. This round and homogeneously enhancing mass is an aneurysm of the internal carotid artery. We can see on the sagittal T1 weighted MR a significant pulsation encoding artifact, and this is directly related to the pulsation of the aneurysm. So in the differential diagnosis of cella, supracellular and paracellular masses. The differential features include adult patients starting first with pituitary adenomas that are intracellular and grow up. In children, craniopharyngiomas and hypothalamic or optic gliomas arise in the supracellular cistern and grow down. If the cell is normal, don't think about a pituitary origin mass. Calcification is suggestive of craniopharyngioma, but occurs as a dystrophic process in many other chronic or long-lasting lesions. If the clivus is destroyed, think about the possibility of chordoma and always remember to rule out vascular lesions. In this next section, we're going to talk about lesions that involve the deeper parts of the brain, in particular the basal ganglia, the thalamus, the lenticular nucleus, and the third ventricle. Here's a 36-year-old that presented with cardiac arrest. The imaging is clearly abnormal. There's a rounded mass in the anterior third ventricle and what looks like a fluid fluid or a blood fluid level in the dependent portion of the occipital horns. The corresponding coronal and sagittal images demonstrate a rounded mass in the anterior third ventricle with peripheral rim enhancement. This is a classic presentation for a colloid cyst. The colloid cyst is the most common mass in the third ventricle in the well-developed countries. In less industrialized countries, cystocercosis can present inside the third ventricle. The location is almost always in the anterior part of the foramen of Monroe with the cyst attached to the roof, sharply demarcated on both MR and CT. However, the attenuation and signal intensity are extremely variable. The lining of a colloid cyst produces mucus, and mucus may be watery or may be dry and inspissated, producing either hyperintensity on a T1-weighted image or being dark on the T2-weighted image. Typically, when there is enhancement, it's only in the rim because that's the only living part of this lesion. We have here sagittal and axial images, again showing this hyperintense lesion in the anterior part of the third ventricle. This beautiful gross picture unfortunately reminds us that colloid cysts can cause sudden and complete obstruction of the lateral ventricles at the foramen of Monroe. The ventricles will continue to expand because of ongoing CSF production and the patient may die from central midline herniation. Here's an example on CT of a dense colloid cyst and a relatively loosened colloid cyst, again reminding us that their variable attenuation is due to the changes in the consistency of the mucus that they contain. Another example of a colloid cyst shows T1 shortening and hyperintensity on the T1 weighted image. However, the corresponding T2 weighted image demonstrates a dark center, the so-called black hole of the colloid cyst. Colloid cysts that are very hypointense like this are too viscous to be aspirated through a stereotactic needle. These patients need endoscopic surgery. Hypertensive hemorrhage can also present in the imaging plane of the third ventricle thalamus of the basal ganglia.
What was illustrated here is a very small, round, well-circumscribed area of hypertenuation in the posterior limb of the internal capsule, the perfect location to cause the patient to have an acute hemiplegia. Spontaneous non-traumatic hemorrhages have many causes, but probably the most common is hypertensive vasculopathy, which is a type of small vessel disease just like diabetes. It may cause hyaline arteriolar sclerosis or hyperplastic arteriolar sclerosis, and it typically affects the small penetrating vessels that supply the deep gray matter and the brainstem. This is a, a coronal uh, autopsy injected specimen illustrating the territory of the middle cerebral artery. And we can see these very, very small non-anastomotic arterioles that are end arteries that supply the deep gray matter. If one of these bursts or ruptures, we typically get a self-limited hematoma because the local tissue pressure from the expanding hematoma causes a tamponade effect. The localization of hypertensive hemorrhages in the deep parts of the brain corresponds with the location of the pathologic process involving these small non-anastomotic end arterioles. Hypertensive hemorrhages, again, are well delimited. They may continue to expand if the tamponade effect is broken by rupture of the hemorrhage into the ventricular system, which is illustrated here. In contrast to a non-traumatic hemorrhage, which typically in the first 24 to 48 hours will only have a circumferential halo of altered signal intensity on CT and MR, which represents the serum that is extruded when the red cells coalesce to form the blood clot, a neoplastic hemorrhage tends to be very heterogeneous and may be surrounded by vasogenic edema, which is illustrated by the case on the right side of the slide. That was a patient who had a glioblastoma multiforme. Here is another patient that has a solitary deep lesion in the area of the thalamus. This is an irregular and heterogeneously enhancing ring lesion, which was a glioblastoma multiforme. Glioblastoma multiforme is usually seen as a solitary, deep, irregular, heterogeneously ring-enhancing mass with surrounding vasogenic edema. Most commonly presenting in adult patients, these are diffuse astrocytomas with a very poor clinical prognosis and a median survival of approximately 12 to 18 months. Here is another glioblastoma multiforme showing a heterogeneous irregular ring enhancing mass with a shaggy inner margin. There is surrounding vasogenic edema, but within that vasogenic edema, we're going to identify infiltration of neoplastic cells because once again, this is a diffuse astrocytoma. So the perilesional signal abnormality is commonly described as just that perilesial signal abnormality consisting of a mixture of vasogenic edema and infiltrating tumor cells. Multiple studies have shown that tumor cells also extend beyond the area of signal abnormality seen on MR as T2 uh, prolongation. So there is tumor cells in the edema, but also tumor cells beyond the edema with diffuse astro. In addition to vascular disease and gliomas in the deep and periventricular brain, there is also the possibility for a patient to have lymphoma and toxoplasmosis. Toxoplasmosis classically causes multiple peri- and periventricular lesions that involve the gray matter and the white matter at the same time. The lesions may be ring enhancing or show nodular enhancement as is shown in this example here. Let's talk briefly about toxic and metabolic disorders because these will also involve the periventricular area, most commonly the periventricular gray matter. If we look at this pair of images here, we see both patients have multiple bilateral and symmetric lesions and the lesions are anatomically localized to different portions of the deep gray matter, including the basal ganglia. This is the typical presentation for a patient who has a toxic or metabolic disorder which may be acquired or it may be congenital. Intrinsic toxic and metabolic diseases include diabetic ketoacidosis, hypoglycemic coma and non-ketotic hyperglycemia, hyperaminemia and other metabolic derangements related to liver failure. Extrinsic toxic exposures include carbon monoxide, nitrous oxide, 
organic alcohols like methanol and ethylene glycol, and solvent leukoencephalopathies. Metabolic imbalance and deficiencies include electrolyte disturbances and deficiencies of thiamine, as in Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome, and vitamin B12, which occurs in subacute combined degeneration. We can see here in this patient who was found comatose at home after an ice storm that there are bilateral lesions involving the medial portion of the lenticular nucleus, which is the globus pallidus. This is a characteristic pattern associated with carbon monoxide toxicity. This is thought to be due to selective vulnerability of the gray matter in the globus pallidus. But an alternate theory has been presented, which is that this is an area of vascular susceptibility and that there is cardiac suppression due to carbon monoxide that is superimposed upon the direct toxic effect of that inhaled gas. Summarizing what we've just seen for lesions involving the deep gray matter, bilateral and symmetric lesions suggest a toxic or metabolic process. Bilateral and asymmetric lesions suggest a hematogenous process such as toxoplasmosis. And unilateral lesions are seen in thalamic gliomas and in hypertensive vascular disease. Let's focus on intraventricular lesions. Sometimes lesions that are outside the ventricle appear to be within the lumen, but one surefire way to know that a tumor is actually inside the ventricle is to see displacement of the margins of the ventricle and to see a meniscus of CSF around the mass, which is shown here in this patient who has a meningioma. The differential diagnosis for intraventricular neoplasms begins with something that's simple to remember. What lives inside the ventricle? The ependema lines the ventricular system. So ependymomas and the subjacent subependymomas may present as intraventricular masses. We have choroid plexus, so we can have choroid plexus neoplasms, including both choroid plexus papillomas, carcinomas, and other tumors of intermediate differentiation. We can have a flavor of astrocytoma, the subependymal giant cell astrocytoma. We can have meningiomas. We can have colloid cysts. In the fourth ventricle, we can have medulloblastoma. We can also have dermoid and epidermoid inclusion cysts. Lesions centered around the septum pellucidum include central neurocytoma. And of course, because the choroid plexus is vascular, we can have Metz, lymphoma, and germ cell tumors also inside the ventricular system. Subependymal giant cell astrocytoma is a WHO grade 1 tumor that is typically associated with tuberous sclerosis in upwards of 90% of the patients. It's almost invariably seen near the foramen of Monroe. The tumor is attached but does not infiltrate into the head of the caudate nucleus. Because the lesion is covered by an intact layer of ependyma, there is no CSF dissemination. The tumor almost invariably shows contrast enhancement, but so do the subependymal hamartomatous nodules that are also part of tuberous sclerosis. Intraventricular meningioma is most commonly seen in adult patients arising from the choroid plexus in the trigone of the lateral ventricle. In this location, there are arachnoid rests from the embryologic migration of pia and arachnoid into the choroidal fissure to produce the choroid plexus in the first place. The tumors may or may not be associated with uh, periventricular interstitial edema. Cerebrospinal fluid is produced by choroid plexus throughout the lateral ventricles, and the choroid plexus extends all the way down to the tip of the temporal horn. Any mass in the trigone of the lateral ventricle may obstruct the flow of CSF and the drainage of the lateral ventricle, causing a trapped temporal horn. In the same trigonal location in childhood, we can see a lobulated mass which is attached to the stalk of the choroid plexus. This is most likely going to be a choroid plexus papilloma. The macroscopic lobulated architecture is the result of the microscopic lobules that we see in the normal choroid plexus. Also notice that the pattern of hydrocephalus that we see here involves all of the ventricles, not just the ones that are proximal to the mechanical location of the lesion. So there must be a different mechanism for the production of hydrocephalus. Some people have suggested that choroid plexus papillomas produce excessive amounts of spinal fluid. 
while others note that the choroid plexus papillomas produce protein and occasionally cause hemorrhage, which may interfere with CSF reabsorption, and the problem may be due to that rather than excessive production of spinal fluid. Macroscopically, the choroid plexus papilloma is composed of multiple papillary structures. This tumor also shows some perioperative hemorrhage in this example. Another example of a choroid plexus papilloma illustrating how the tumor has grown out of the fourth ventricle and into the cerebellopontine angle cistern. Once again, notice how there are multiple little papilla within the tumor. Some people have suggested that it actually looks like the fronds that you get in a broccoli head. Microscopically, the normal choroid plexus as well as the choroid plexus papilloma consists of multiple papillary structures surrounding a vascular core with an epithelium on the surface that secretes cerebrospinal fluid. Ependymomas tend to be within a single lateral ventricle. The same is true for choroid plexus papillomas. However, there is one lesion that very commonly extends to involve both lateral ventricles simultaneously, and this is the central neurocytoma. Central neurocytomas are thought to arise from embryologic rests in the septum pellucidum. They commonly have uh, complications by foci of hemorrhage and calcification. They are relatively hyperattenuating on the non-contrast CT scan. They tend to have a signal intensity similar to gray matter on MR. Let's now turn our attention to pineal region masses, which are most commonly actually within the subarachnoid space of the quadrigeminal plate cistern. This includes germ cell tumors and adjacent gliomas arising from the splenium of the corpus callosum and the thalamus. Pineal region masses used to be called pinealomas. This was a histologic mistake since the most common tumors found in this location are germ cell tumors that are nearly identical to testicular seminomas. But because the neurosurgeons insisted that these seminomas were arising from the pineal gland, the pathologist adopted the term pinealomas. The pinealoma is actually totally incorrect. Pinealoma is a wastebasket term. In fact, the trash can in my office is labeled pinealoma. The two most common flavors of germ cell tumor are the seminoma histology, also called dysgerminoma and atypical teratoma, and teratomas. We can also have pineal parenchymal tumors that can be immature blastomas or mature cytomas. And again, as mentioned before, we can have regional gliomas arising from the corpus callosum or the thalamus and sometimes the brainstem. Other lesions of the pineal region include dermoid and epidermoid cysts, lipomas, arachnoid cysts, meningiomas arising from the tentorium or the fox that secondarily grow into the quadrigeminal plate cistern, and vein of Galen malformations. Typically, when we have a pineal region germinoma, we have a centrally located mass. It's classically homogeneous. It oftentimes is described as engulfing or surrounding a central calcification, which is felt to be within the residual remnants of the pineal gland. The lesion is hyperattenuating compared to brain on the non-contrast CT scan. It may have some restricted diffusion on MR, and we have to always look for the possibility of CSF seeding. So the classic appearance is one of an engulfed or surrounded pineal calcification. Here is another example illustrating on CT that the lesion is related to the quadrigeminal plate cistern. They can sometimes invade into the posterior part of the third ventricle. The tumor is hyperattenuating and is surrounding a calcification, which again is not within the tumor itself, but is residual calcification within the engulfed or surrounded pineal gland. What causes this hyperattenuation and restricted diffusion on the MR imaging. Well, there's a two cell pattern in the germinoma, and one of these cells is a small round blue cell that looks just like a lymphocyte and may actually be a reactive lymphocyte. Pineal region tumors of almost any histology have the ability to extend through the tentorial hiatus and into the posterior fossa. Two different mechanisms have been proposed for this extension of pineal region masses into the posterior fossa. This may just be the growth vector 
the path of least resistance, but it could also be the result of obstructive hydrocephalus because the mass is compressing the top of the cerebral aqueduct at the posterior part of the third ventricle. In fact, about two-thirds of pineal region masses are operated on through a suboccipital infratentorial neurosurgical approach. Here's another example of the same phenomenon. This is a different patient who also has a germinoma. The lesion shows relatively homogeneous enhancement. If we look at the outline of the leaflets of the tentorium, we can see that the majority of this mass is actually in the posterior fossa. CSF dissemination is possible with any of the pineal region masses because they are oftentimes unencapsulated and they are in the subarachnoid space, so they have direct access to CSF flow. Again, here we have a five-year-old child who has a hyper-attenuating mass surrounding a central calcification. The vast majority of pineal region germ cell tumors have a two to seven to one uh, male to female ratio, and this was a young boy who presented with back pain. The MR demonstrated multiple tumorlets in the lumbar spine. It was thought the patient was going to have a medulloblastoma causing CSF dissemination, which is far more common. But intracranially, the patient has a classic appearance for a pineal region seminoma, germinoma, dysgerminoma. Here's a patient that has a pineal region teratoma. You want to remember that teratomas produce heterogeneous signal intensity and attenuation because they're composed of multiple different kinds of tissues. Classically, teratomas can produce ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm, and these tissues may also contain dystrophic calcification. In this particular example, the arrow is pointing to lipid material. The lipid is lucent on the CT, and it is a high signal on the T1-weighted MR, and when we give contrast material, the solid portions of the tumor show heterogeneous enhancement. So in the context of a pineal region mass, this is classic for a pineal region teratoma. Let's now turn our attention to deep hemispheric lesions that are a little bit higher up than the basal ganglia and include the corpus callosum. The cartoons here illustrate the classic bihemispheric transcolossal spread of infiltrating tumors, one a glioblastoma and one a primary CNS lymphoma. So when we have a lesion in the deep white matter and periventricular area, we start first about thinking about infiltrating glial tumors, most commonly astrocytoma, but sometimes oligodendroglioma, uh, much more commonly going to be a high grade in this location, primary CNS lymphoma. We can also have as a paraventricular location, toxoplasmosis, and cytomegalovirus, CMV, can cause ependymitis. We can have a wide variety of white matter diseases. We can have small vessel disease, and uh, we can have lacunar and tri-watershed infarcts. Hemorrhage is also possible in these locations. The primary differential bifurcates. Does the lesion produce mass effect or does the lesion produce volume loss? And that will help differentiate. But one proviso, one warning, acute white matter disease may cause short-term mass effect. And the prime example of that is tumefactive demyelination. Illustrated here are our cartoons. If we have a lesion in the corpus callosum with irregular peripheral rim enhancement, that's the shape that we associate with glioblastoma multiforme. In contrast to that, primary CNS lymphoma tends to remain relatively homogeneous. It tends to have a more fluffy pattern of contrast enhancement, and that's illustrated here in the adjacent case. One of the things that is very helpful when you think the patient has primary CNS lymphoma is to look for the signs of having a small round blue cell tumor. Homogeneously hyperattenuating on the non-contrast CT scan and darker signal on the flare in the T2-weighted image are signs that you have a small round blue cell tumor, which is illustrated here in this other example. Again, we see relatively homogeneous enhancement. It's always good to remember that although primary CNS lymphoma is typically going to be homogeneous, in patients who are immune suppressed as opposed to patients who are immune competent, they often have atypical flavors of primary CNS lymphoma that are prone to either hemorrhage or cavitation.
One of my fellows used to call primary CNS lymphoma rymphoma because it provides a rim around the ventricle. This is a very common mode of spread for primary CNS lymphoma. It involves the periventricular tissue and then extends through the ependema into the ventricle. Again, here on the non-contrast CT scan, you can see that the patient's right ventricle is rimmed by hyperattenuating tissue and very subtle on the non-contrast CT, but obvious after contrast is given is that there has been spread to the contralateral side with peripheral rim enhancement around the patient's left ventricle. So if we see a thick rim around the ventricle, one of the first things to think about is primary CNS rymphoma. Again, I mentioned the patient could have ependymitis. Ependymitis tends to produce thin linear enhancement of the ventricular rim. And one thing that's illustrated here is that about five minutes elapsed between the axial images and the coronal images, and the thickness of the ependymal enhancement appears greater once there's been a little bit of delay to allow more contrast to diffuse into the tissues. So this is CMV ependymitis. So ependymitis gives us a thin rim of enhancement around the ventricle, and primary CNS lymphoma is going to give us a very, very thick and irregular rim of enhancement around the ventricle. And that's a, a really easy way to try to narrow down your differential diagnosis when you have periventricular enhancement. Obviously, if we're talking about the white matter in the cerebral hemispheres, we can have multiple sclerosis, the most common demyelinating disease. The classic appearance for multiple sclerosis is ovoid areas of demyelination and abnormal signal. These classically surround small venous structures that may be identified in susceptibility weighted imaging. This is called the central vein sign. And the orientation of the oval is to have the long axis perpendicular to the margin of the ventricle. It kind of looks like this guy that has a mohawk haircut. Always look at the colossal septal interface because that's where you're most likely to see a signal abnormality at the undersurface of the corpus callosum. Let's now look at cortical and subcortical lesions. This is an area where we have to talk about cerebritis. We have to talk about uh, patients who have ischemia and infarctions and also post-ictal uh, abnormalities after having a seizure. And we can also have hematogenous dissemination. Sometimes lesions may cavitate either because of chemotherapy or because they're actually small abscesses as occurs in patients that have a subacute bacterial endocarditis. So lesions that are involving the convexity that are intraaxial, we think about lesions at the gray-white matter junction, hematogenous neoplasm and infection and multiple thrombi, ischemia and infarction, and of course vasculitis is more likely to affect the gray matter than the white matter merely because there are four times as many vessels in the gray matter as in the white matter. So if we look at this image here, before contrast we see relatively little, uh, when we look at the T2-weighted image, we see that there are multiple lesions, and when we give contrast material, we see multiple well-defined, rounded, circumscribed lesions, the typical appearance for hematogenous dissemination. I want to emphasize that although we always talk about METs as being a subcortical lesion, METs also will park and lodge in the perforating vessel that supply the deep gray matter. And you can see here that there's a MET in the caudate nucleus and a MET in the thalamus as well. This is a patient with metastatic breast cancer. Here's a patient that has a metastatic melanoma. Really nice to see on the path because they're very, very dark. This is a pigmented melanoma. And again, highlighting that metastatic disease, hematogenous dissemination can involve the lenticulostriate vessels as well as involving the subcortical white matter or gray white matter junction. Multifocal ring lesions. Uh, I made a mistake in this case. I thought this was an IV drug abuser. Uh, and then I had a chance to meet the admiral's wife and I found out that she had uh, breast cancer that was undergoing active chemotherapy and the chemotherapy was successful uh, in killing the embolized tumor, the dissemination, the metastatic disease. So this is metastatic breast cancer on chemotherapy. We can also have gyroform or cortical enhancement. We can also have meningitis producing superficial 
enhancement for the patient. As we all know, cerebral infarction is associated with an acute or abrupt onset of symptoms. A CT scan may demonstrate the hyperdense middle cerebral artery sign, and we classically look for matching diffusion on ADC abnormalities, bright on DWI, dark on the ADC map. And of course, if untreated, this is going to uh, progress to the patient having atrophy. In our differential diagnosis for cortically based lesions, you want to consider the clinical context. This is a 13 year old boy who has seizures. That's not the presentation by age or by symptomatology for a patient who has cerebral ischemia or infarction. If we look carefully at the images, we can see that there is a bubble like appearance. So, another cortical wedge lesion to consider is dysembryoplastic neuroepithelial tumor or DNET, which is what this patient had. This is another patient that has a dysembryoplastic neuropathelial tumor. And in this case, we can see a really useful sign, which is periosteal remodeling of the inner table of the skull. This can be produced by any superficial mass lesion. It could be a DNET. We also want to remember that oligodendrogliomas are capable of uh, arising in the cortex and having a long clinical course before a presentation, and they may also be associated with periosteal remodeling of the inner table of the skull. The last thing we're going to talk about are lesions that are extraaxial and around the convexity of the cerebral hemispheres. We're going to talk about hemorrhages and meningiomas. Convexity or extraaxial differential includes epidural lesions, which may be hematoma, empyema, or metastasis. Classically, because they are subtended by the periosteum of the inner table, they are biconvex and limited by the sutures. We can have subdural collections, which are actually also in the epiarachnoid space, and that may also be blood pus or metastatic disease. These are typically crescentic and concave towards the brain. The patient may have a subacute or delayed presentation and they cross the sutures. And then we have meningiomas. And we're all familiar with the fact that meningiomas are going to be hyperattenuating, hemispheric, associated with hyperostosis, and have homogeneous contrast enhancement. So Extraaxial lesions, biconvex, epidural hematoma, concave towards the brain. We're thinking about a subdural hematoma, classic epidural hematoma here. Remember, these are between the periosteum and the bone. They typically stop at the sutures unless the fracture itself has crossed the suture line. Epidural metastasis also has the same uh, biconvex kind of appearance because it's tethered by the dura. This is subdural metastatic disease. It is concave towards the brain. Again, the shape is defined by the space within which the malignant cells or the pus or the blood are accumulating or collecting. And then the last thing we want to finish up with is talking about meningioma. And this is where we began in our discussion of differential diagnosis by location with a homogeneously enhancing hemispheric lesion with a broad base against the dural surface, hyperostosis, and a little bit of a dural tail coming off of it. So in summary, we can use the location of the lesion as a triangulation to narrow down the differential diagnosis. Lesions that are extraaxial are typically non-glial, like schwannoma and meningioma. Lesions in the ventricle can be choroid plexus tumors, ependymomas, or meningioma. Lesions in the corpus callosum can be gliomas or primary CNS lymphoma. And we just finished talking about superficial and cortical-based lesions. Thank you all very, very much for listening to me.